Thank you all for coming uh, to this event entitled Labor in America, Not in Qatar, Past, Present, and Future of Unions. It's a topic that's the subject of breaking news today, in case you're following. Uh, my name is Anat Admati. I'm a finance professor here, and I'm the founder and co-faculty director of the Corporation Society Initiative, CASC, uh, here at Stanford Graduate School of Business, which is sponsoring this panel discussion. CASI focuses on promoting effective governance to ensure that corporations and other institutions serve society. We support various engagements at Stanford and beyond to explore, broaden, and deeper, deepen the discussion of complex interactions between corporations, government, civil society, and the media. We particularly focus in, in our events uh, on topics and perspectives that tend to get underrepresented in business school curricula as well as extracurricular activities. So you're a bit more likely to find investigative journalists uh, and policymakers in our events than um, corporate executives and entrepreneurs, which already uh, are very present in courses and outside the classroom in events. Uh, CASI is powered by students, faculty, and staff. Um, and on the student part, we have a, a rotating uh, group of student leaders, which this year includes five awesome second year MBA students and one, for the first time, uh, MSX student uh, as well, uh, who uh, are very much part of the joint effort to bring uh, together, especially events like this. Uh, in this, uh, we are just off a, an event uh, that I was particularly involved in uh, about Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, a mini conference uh, on climate risk and corporations. Uh, that was fascinating just before the holidays. Stay tuned for a video in case you missed it. Um, and we are videotaping today as well. In this particular uh, case, this particular event, uh, the idea for the event and a lot of the energy for this event came from our student leader, Juan Saez, who I'm going to let now introduce the event itself and the panelists that we have here today. Thank you again for joining us and even missing soccer live at this point uh, for, uh, for this great discussion that I look forward to. At my, my first official mentor at my first job, he was a partner, uh, said in our first meeting ever, Unions are a plague for America. Um, coming to Stanford, I expected a slightly more balanced discussion of collective bargaining and the real trade-offs made in protecting the rights of employees to organize. Rather, um, unions have been scarcely mentioned in class, and when they are, when organized labor is brought up, it's often framed as a problem for management to deal with. So today, I hope we can kick off a more nuanced discourse around the role that unions play um, in our present society. In an age of rising monopoly power and increasing concentration of wealth, we need to prioritize discussions of how we elevate the voices, rights, and needs of workers across organizational hierarchies. The group we have brought together today, uh, I think is perfect to get the wheels turning on this kind of dialogue. So before handing off to Lenny, I really, wanna, I really quickly wanna introduce the esteemed group of panelists that we have here. I started with Peter Olney. Uh, so Peter Olney has had a lifelong career in organizing labor. This career was briefly interrupted uh, when Peter decided to pursue an, M an MBA at UCLA after repeatedly hearing from management, you just don't know how to read a financial statement. So he decided to flip that script a little bit. He returned straight back to the organizing movement uh, and got straight back to work. Peter is a retired organizing director of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, which primarily represents dock, dock workers on the West Coast. He has been a labor organizer for 50 years. Valerie Hardy Mahoney has been at the National Labor Relations Board for decades after joining the Oakland Regional Office in 1982 as a field attorney. She has stayed in the region and is now the regional director based out of the Oakland office. A career-long fight for employees' federally protected rights have led Valerie to lead cases against both corporations and against unions. Dave Reagan has a vision for a redesigned social contract and legal framework for the protection of workers' rights. 
He um, is the president of the Service Employees International Union, uh, and specifically United Healthcare Workers West, so S-E-I-U dash U-H-W, long, long name there, one of the largest hospital unions in the United States. And then lastly, our esteemed moderator here, Lenny Mendonca. Lenny is a former lecturer on inequality here at the GSB, has served as the chief economic and business advisor to California Governor Gavin Newsom, and as the chair of the, of the California High, High Speed Rail Authority. With those in introductions, I'll uh, go ahead and hand it over to, to Lenny. Lenny. Thank you, thank you. And it's, uh, it's great to see so many of you in, in the room and some of you listening in. It's great to see uh, friends and colleagues, former colleagues here, including uh, Paul Oyer, who's actually the person who taught the course that I participated in that was mentioned, so thank you. Um, one ground rule for today, which is there's gonna be no mention of a football or soccer match that's going on right now. Some of us are taping it and we don't wanna know what's going on so we can watch it fresh when we get back. So appreciate you all stepping out of that for this important conversation. And in all seriousness, this is a very important conversation. As you all know, um, we're at an important point in the nation's economy, in the nature of how we think about how the spoils of economics are distributed across various portions of society and the important role that organized labor plays in that. And I'm really delighted that the business school is having this kind of conversation and having a, a serious one about how should this topic be embedded in the MBA education. So thank you all for participating and thank you all for our panelists. This should be a really rich discussion. I'll moderate with a few questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, so Valerie, if I could start with you. Um, just to ground us all, because I know that people here have different history and understanding of labor law in the U.S., can you just give us a little bit of context around kind of what the current environment is and the right to organize and, and where we are today? Well, we are at a very exciting um, juncture in the life of our agency. We have been around for almost 88 years enforcing the National Labor Relations Act. And the act was really the um, product arising from labor and political strife that led up to the New Deal. And it was signed into law by President Roosevelt in 1935. And in this law, Congress proclaimed that it is the policy of the United States of America to encourage collective bargaining. And so by enacting the NLRA, the government promised democracy in the workplace. And so what does that mean? It begins with a speaker and a listener. And wherever there is a speaker and a listener, you have protected concerted activity. And if you have protected concerted activity, most of those speakers and listeners are going to decide that they need to look into whether or not they want a union. So in the course of my 40-year career, I feel that we are in a spot where the future of unions is actually hopeful. And it's hopeful to me because the message that employees have rights to form, join, or support a union, or to refrain from doing so, that message is getting to more and more employees. Whether they are working in high paid Silicon Valley jobs or working at a chicken processing plant in the valley or making lattes at a Santa Cruz coffee shop or graduate students who are teaching at a prestigious university. That message has gotten to them. So um, all manners of workers seeking democracy in the workplace um, have done so perhaps because many employers fell short in protecting employee 
health and safety in two years of a 100-year uh, pandemic. And so, of course, we all, those of us that were working at home, teleworking, we had a lot to think about while we were at home and while we were under this existential fear that we could die or our loved ones could die, and many people did die. So I think people had a lot to think about, whether they were going to stay in their job, whether they were on the right path. And so they also learned that basically without a union in the workplace, um, you really have no one to sort of equal the balance of power between employees and employers. And so people have brought more life to the labor movement in just the last couple of years. And so we have mass organizing efforts um, and of huge companies that are household names. And so it's a very exciting time. And I guess if you learn one thing today, please learn that when you go on to lead a company or create a company and your employees start talking, you have no right to keep them from speaking about their wages. And that's sort of one of the a quintessential um, right of an employee. And a quintessential question to want to know what the person uh, that just came to your workplace, how much are they making? And so many cases we have today where an employer has a rule in place or a policy in place, or maybe they just off the cuff decide, wait a minute, you can't do that. You can't ask those questions. And to me, that is such an outrageous um, mindset to think in America that you could prohibit one employee from saying to their coworker, how much do you get paid? I get paid X. I've been here five years. You, you just got here, and you're paid more than me? And where does that question take people? It takes you to a place of trying to understand what's fair and why you're not being treated the way you think you should be treated. And then that leads you to that other question. Maybe I need someone else here to speak for me, to engage in collective bargaining, to protect me when things go wrong in the universe, and coming to work is a matter of life and death. So that's my main uh, point for today, that there are quintessential rights to speak to each other, to improve your working conditions, to come together, to um, organize a union. And these are not just NLRB rights. In a, in a real sense, they are human rights, the right of free association. No one can tell you who you can associate with. And you shouldn't lose your livelihood because you've contacted a union. And that happens, and that happens more and more. And so we're at a really fine point in our agency because of our leadership under the board itself, which is a five-member board in DC that sits in DC that decides cases that come up from the regions, and also because of the leadership of our general counsel, Jennifer Abruzzo, who has really sought to bring the word, get the word out to everyone in places where we haven't traditionally done outreach, um, to immigrant workers, to um, people who have been underrepresented, to people who have been marginalized. And so as a result, our case intake is sky high, um, but unfortunately, our budget has gotten, um, it has been depleted year after year because we have only been given um, level funding. And so it's, in essence, it's like a cut every year. So um, remember that your employees have rights. And of course, you have rights too under the Act. Employers do file charges against unions. And employees file charges against unions. Um, but most of the charges that are filed are against employers. Um, most of the meritorious charges we investigate and then issue complaint and go to trial on are against employers. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that context and reminder to all of us. Um, Peter, I'm tempted to ask you about, did you get any value out of an MBA? But I won't. 
but I do want to uh, ask you a little about, you just have to open the newspaper today, as Anat mentioned, and issues around important labor questions are on the table. You know, the president's talking about having Congress intervene in a potential rail strike. The University of California the academic leaders are on strike, and CSU were talking about it. Uh, Amazon and Starbucks, just to mention two brand names, are under uh, substantial efforts to, to organize. And literally on two organizations that I'm on the board of in Washington, D.C., just got uh, unionized in the last year, New America Foundation, New, New America and Common Cause. Um, is there something going on now is it just because we're in a tight labor market and it's post-COVID? Is it because we have a new administration, relatively new administration? What, what's going on? Why, why is all this happening now? Great. Well, first, I do want to acknowledge the value of an MBA <laughs> working in the labor movement. And I've actually encouraged other labor organizers to, to do an MBA. And one of them, Dave probably knows him, John Marshall, who works for the United Food and Commercial Workers, went all the way. He did the UCLA Anderson program that I did. And then he worked, went to work for a venture capitalist on Wall Street, learned all the tricks of finance, and he's now the director of capital strategies for that union. So yes, the NBA can be useful on the other side of the, of the class struggle divide. So those of you that are interested in labor, stick with your MBA, but then come see us. Um, yeah, you're, you're hitting it. I mean, there's a couple seminal events. We're coming up on the anniversary of the victory in Buffalo at Starbucks uh, under the aegis of Workers United, which is a union, part of Dave's union, the Service Employees International Union. And that moment and that drive led by a, a Rhodes Scholar, by the way, the barista who led that drive is a Rhodes Scholar, and this is one of the factors that's driving a lot of this excitement. That victory has led to 150 victories at Starbucks around the country. Now, there's 9,000 stores, so we're a long way from the promised land, but it sparked discussion and interest in organization among a lot of young people, a lot of young people in the labor market. The other seminal event is April of this year when the workers on Staten Island at the giant Amazon Fulfillment Center voted with an independent union, the Amazon Labor Union, to be represented. And this just sent shockwaves throughout the country, the economy, and the labor movement. So these, these two events are seminal events. I would argue that neither Amazon nor the movement around Starbucks would be happening without the excellent National Labor Relations Board that we have in the General Counsel that Valerie rep, uh, mentioned. My boss. Your boss, right. A uh, couple of reasons. One is, in, in Buffalo, the company, Starbucks, attempted to say, you cannot have an election at a single Starbucks. You must have an election at all the Starbucks in the Buffalo area because it's common management, leadership, et cetera. And the board ruled against that and said, no, there can be a single store election. And those elections have proliferated around the country. In Staten Island, because of violations of the act where speech was suppressed, people were fired, the board ordered that workers from that facility on their off shift, in other words, could come into the lunchroom and talk union with workers who were working. As an organizing director in my day, I would have died for something like that. What a wonderful thing to have your best worker organizers be able to go into the lunchroom and talk to the workers who are actually working. So those are a couple of decisions that don't get a lot of attention but are very important to fueling this kind of organizing. And yes, Joe Biden is probably the most pro-labor president uh, maybe in history. I mean, Joe Biden has explicitly said that workers should join unions. Franklin Roosevelt never said that. Uh, John L. Lewis said he said that to him in a private meeting, but he never said it publicly. Biden has said that. He uses the U word constantly, which surprises us who have been around for, you know, we hear these platitudes from politicians on our side, but they never use the U word. Well, he uses the U word. 
So this administration has been a tremendous support to organizing. The COVID has fueled some of this, as Valerie mentioned. A young generation of disaffected folks, a Rhodes, a Rhodes Scholar leading an organizing drive. So there's a bunch of factors that have led us to this moment of a lot of labor effervescence and excitement. Is it just me, or does California feel like it's in the labor movement as well as more generally at a place where there's a lot of interesting newer things happening? You know, we have the recent legislation for AB5 and then a subsequent ballot initiative, the laws that were passed that require wage transparency, minimum wage and activities that have been through the legislature and on the ballot. Is there something about in the water in California since you've been here that's creating different momentum, or what, what's going on here? Yeah, I, I guess in a, I've said this to Lenny before, you know, I think in a lot of ways, you know, California is the most interesting laboratory in America. Um, you can make that argument about the tech industry, you can make that argument about, you know, other sorts of social and cultural developments. And, um, and as someone who does this work, you know, Peter and myself have spent decades doing it, the labor movement is still large enough here. It, it's shrinking, by the way. The labor movement is shrinking across America, including in California, and it's inexorable. And so there's this kind of this cultural myth that unions are these incredibly powerful institutions and growing. It, in fact, the, the opposite is true. We're shrinking here just like we're shrinking everywhere, although we're starting from a bit of a higher vantage point. But I think if we're going to reinvent ourselves, I think if we're going to figure out what the solution to the, the problem is, there's no better place in America. And you know, I think politics does matter. Um, what's, there's a lot of interesting things about California politics. And one of the emerging things is the country changes. Um, you know, historically, people think of, you know, whether it's President Biden or the Democrats as being the allies of labor. What I think you're starting to see in California is the way that um, business interests and, you know, large, well-organized corporate interests are actually supplanting organized labor as a key funder of the historical coalition, you know, on the Democratic side that supported, supported unions. And, I think that's something we're going to have to figure out going forward. But having said all of that, if we can't figure it out here, we can't figure it out anywhere. Um, and I think we have a responsibility. I appreciate, you know, Peter mentioned uh, John L. Lewis, and I feel like we're dating ourselves here, but, you know, John L. Lewis was the president of the United Mine Workers, and he used that union to basically organize the industrial unions that built the American middle class, the rubber workers, the electrical workers, the auto workers, none of those unions could have gotten off the ground if it weren't for the mine workers financing and supporting that and sending organizers across the country even before the NLRA took effect. And so I think it's a, a lesson that those of us with large organizations here in California, you know, what's our responsibility to help seed nascent organizations in other parts of the country uh, to do this. And, you know, like Peter, I'm hopeful about what we see at Amazon and Starbucks and the UC system and all of that kind of thing. But the, the last point I'll make, and it's something I'm obsessed with, is just the scale of the challenge. If you care about unions, if you care about democracy with a small d in America, um, you know, you have to appreciate I want two things I'd suggest to people. We are further away in time from the passage of the NLRA, 87 years, as Valerie said. The NLRA was passed 70 years after the end of the American Civil War. So we're now further away in time. The law we're relying on is closer, its passage is closer in time to the end of the Civil War than it is till today, which is something, there's a bit of an anachronistic effect to it. Second thing is the American labor force is 160 million people. 
For unions to grow by 1% in America, you have to not just organize, but you have to get under contract 1.6 million workers. Even with all of the activity we hear about, there will be petitions filed for less than 200,000 workers this year through the National Labor Relations Act. So the scale and the magnitude of our challenge is immense. And I think, again, if you care about it, we got to figure it out in places like California, or we can't cobble it all together to make it work. I'm going to come back this way and go back to you one more time, Dave. So um, you've been involved and are involved in a number of activities that aren't traditional labor organizing, but are about bringing more worker voice and worker power. What gets you excited about the potential for the, the opportunity that you, you're aspiring to? You know, I, I really do believe it's almost kind of this religious belief with, that I have is the, the vast majority of the public in this country doesn't like what they see with the, the level and the increasing trend towards inequality. People don't like that. People really are against that. Um, people think, you know, the society is fundamentally unfair and its economy is fundamentally unfair in profoundly important ways. But the institutions that we have to combat that, it's just like what you see in the political sphere um, is huge majorities of Americans think the federal minimum wage ought to be increased dramatically. It can't be passed in the US Congress. The institution that we rely on doesn't work to deliver what the majority wants. Same thing is true in the economy. Most American workers want to have a union but they can't get it. And they can't get it because we have a, a solution or a mechanism that just doesn't deliver. So what, what I, I'm a perverse optimist. You know, what I start with is that what we're trying to create is what people actually want. It's incredibly hard to do. And there's all kinds of pitfalls and challenges and all of that. But what I rely on is that, you know, this is what people want, this is what people need, and, and I think the world and the society is better off if we can figure it out. And what we've lacked um, is that the social contract has broken down. When the National Labor Relations Act was passed, large swaths of the business community thought that it was legitimate and appropriate for workers to have organizations. That's not true today. And so people like yourselves can do something about that going forward. And if we can reconstruct a different sort of sense of what is fair and just and appropriate, then, then the perverse optimists in the world will feel better. So that's what I take solace in anyway. Thank you. Um, Peter, so this may be a little bit of an unfair question since you're retired and don't have to do this, but that's why I'm going to ask you the question. Um, you mentioned Starbucks and how it's how the one store started. They're in the process of transitioning to a new CEO from the founder who will be in place early next year. If you were to sit down with him or have a conversation with the, those who are trying to organize at Starbucks, what would, what would your advice to him be? You mean advice to the CEO or yes. advice to the workers? Both. Well, my advice to the CEO would be uh, sit down with the union Sign an agreement that covers all your baristas in the country. Promote yourself as a union coffee shop that pays great wages and benefits and gives workers rights. Uh, if I'm talking to the workers, um, and I do talk to those workers, and I've talked to a lot of their organizers, they face a real dilemma because you can organize a store with 20 employees, and you're going to organize 150 stores, each one of them with 20 employees, but are you going to be able to get a contract for those workers that changes their lives? And my own insight to this is, I don't think so. I don't think unless you can spread the conflagration to many more stores so that Howard Schultz says, I want a union because I can't live like this. I can't operate anymore with this level of disruption. But the, the challenge there, as Dave well knows, and, 
And as Valerie knows, is those workers who voted for the union in that store voted, many of them, on the, on the premise of, I want to see a change in my work life. And if they don't see a change, are we going to start to lose and erode support so that that vision I have of spreading the conflagration turns into its opposite? So I tell Schultz, sit down and bargain. I tell the workers, we've got to fan the flames, and particularly in metro areas. You know, we're probably not going to be able to do Starbucks everywhere, but if we can do things in metro areas, we may have a shot. Great. Um, Valerie, you mentioned the important role that the NRA plays and the NRB's delivery of, of the law for protecting workers' rights. What, what are the issues that are at the forefront today as it relates to things coming before the NRA or things that are in conversations and legislation that are important for future of organized labor? Well, really, I think that one of the key things is to um, get the board to get the cases to the board where they can change current law. For example, we have a big push now to um, get the board to change the law on captive audience meetings. Um, captive audience meetings are mandatory meetings that are set by an employer as soon as they know that there's a union uh, or union talk amongst their employees. And so they will, they do, sometimes they do it very elaborately, like they focus on which people they're going to call to which group. They hire consultants. Um, the consultants uh, maybe have a script, but then they diverge from the script and can very often begin to commit unfair labor practices by what they say to employees in these meetings. Um, maybe the CEO comes into the facility for the first time, and so they're at this meeting, and so the employer is giving this big push. Unions are bad. You don't need a union. And there's a certain line that you cross when you go from your opinion about a union um, to violating the NLRA by committing an 8A1 violation, a threat a threat that it will be futile for you people to select a union. That's a garden variety um, unfair labor practice that if it came before me, I would find merit to it, and we would be issuing a complaint if the employer didn't settle the case. And so right now, um, captive audience meetings, it's, it's, they can get really close, but the way they say things, it's just not, it doesn't make the threshold to find a violation, but employees know what they're saying. They're saying something here when they say, you don't need a union, uh, work with us. And so employees start to think, well, maybe I don't need a union. Um, maybe we can get this deal by ourselves. Or uh, employees or employers will um, have an implied promise of benefits. And so the employers are saying, hey, the boss, they're, they're not saying it directly, but I think what they're saying is if we don't vote for the union, we're going to get something. We're going to get that change. That change is going to come about without a union. And so uh, many times a union will organize a place, have 50, 60, 75 percent of the workers have signed a card authorizing the union to represent them. By the time the employer the employer's campaign uh, goes on for weeks, having these meetings uh, and making these subtle things that maybe they're, they're a threat, maybe we'll wind up issuing a complaint, but by the time the election comes, the union loses. And so we know that they have an impact. So right now, the general counsel is looking at um, these meetings in and of themselves are uh, unlawful to have this kind of meeting where it's mandatory, where employees uh, are required to come into a room and listen, and they can't say, you know, I've done my own research. I think I want a union. I don't need to hear this. And you're playing on people's fears. You're going to say things that I don't really want to hear. You can't do that because you will get fired right now if you don't go to the captive audience meeting. And they're very destructive. And so we are in multiple regions. Uh, we have issued complaints on the theory that the 
holding of the captive audience meeting at this critical juncture where employees can be tricked, essentially, into not going forward and, and voting for what they originally wanted. Um, there are other um, areas um, of the law that um, we're really pursuing, but it's going to take time because it's the right case has got to get before the board, and it's got to be the right board. Um, what's going to happen if we have President DeSantis in two years? Um, President DeSantis eventually will fire <laughs> Jennifer Abruzzo, and the openings on the board will be filled with people who are uh, not interested in employee rights. And so then we'll have another period, um, which is sort of the bane of people that work for the government um, as public servants. Uh, it's all about the Constitution, it's about democracy, and when people go to speak at the polls for national elections and they switch sides, like people voted for Obama and then they voted for Trump. I, I'll never understand that. I'll never understand that. Um, people flip a coin, I guess, or they feel we need something new, rather than looking at their own self-interest and all the problems that we have that are unresolved in society, the inequality, et cetera, and they're not thinking about that. They're, or they're totally disengaged and they're not voting at all. So um, it's, it, it, there's also another push to look more closely at the um, first contract bargaining because that's also a very vulnerable um, time in the progress to get that change because you voted a union in and employers have lots of tricks, lots of things can happen at the bargaining table to uh, wear down the process and there's no real progress. And I'd say from our point of view, it's really hard to um, get the evidence that we would need to issue a complaint against the employer or an injunction to enjoin the employer from their bad faith bargaining so that the spark um, and the promise of democracy in America isn't thwarted by unfair labor practices. And so we are um, trying to look at the cases and change case law and get the right cases before the board in that area too. Sounds like you got a full plate. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask a couple more questions and then we'll open it up for some audience Q&A. Um, so Peter, one of the most important um, labor conversations that is happening right now um, that will, depending how it plays out, have a big impact on the overall economy US is the rail conversation that's going on now. Uh, in and of itself, that industry is very large, has obviously important impacts on the entire supply chain logistics system. Can you give us a little color on what's going on there? What's, what are the issues and uh, you know, the president's talking about getting involved? What, what's gonna happen here? Yeah. Complicated situation with a lot of history. Um, goes back to, actually it goes back to 1894, but, uh, um, and Eugene Debs and the attempt to organize one railway union called the American Railway Union. Uh, Debs and the Pullman strike was unsuccessful. The, his union was crushed. He was put in jail. And since that time, we've had multiple unions representing railroad workers based on different crafts and different jobs. So you have 12 unions representing about 130,000 workers who were working for the class one railroads in this country, which are the big freight railroads, Union Pacific, Burlington Northern, uh, CSX, those uh, workers and those unions operate under a different legal regime than the regime that uh, Valerie is in charge of and enforces. They operate under the Railway Labor Act, which was passed in 1926 after a national rail strike in 1921 paralyzed the country. At that time, there were 1.3 million railroad workers in this country. Um, and so the parties decided uh, that we, we can't have this kind of disruption of our economy anymore. We need a legal regime that regulates those workers and their employment relationships with their railroads. So you have a very complicated system that involves 
presidential intervention, uh, long-term mediation, and ultimately involves Congress imposing a settlement if there were to be a strike or a lockout. So come December, uh, the moment will be there under the law for some of these unions potentially to walk out on strike. And if one union goes out, it's likely that all the others are going to respect their picket line, so effectively crippling the freight railroads, which handle about 30 to 40 percent of gross national product in this country and cannot be replaced by trucks overnight or ever. So this is a major strategic industry. These are very strategic workers, ultimately could exercise tremendous power and tremendous power for good in this country. But the problem we have is that they're fractured into multiple crafts. The big issue that's driving a lot of the discontent and a lot of the unions having rejected the agreement, they went to a vote of the membership, the membership is rejected. The big issue is time off. And at this moment, they basically do not have the ability to take time off for illness or whatever without doctor's notes and a whole rigmarole. So they're very angry about that. The pay, the pay uh, increase is relatively good. But this issue of time off, this issue of dignity, is what's fueling a lot of the revolt among the rank and file railroad workers. So we'll see what happens. Ultimately, Congress could get involved and could end up imposing a settlement on these workers. We also have other experts in the room. We have uh, William Gould here, who was chair of the NLRB, and uh, he's in the back of the room. He probably has more expertise than anyone, and certainly than I do, on the Railway Labor Act. So I'll stop there. Okay. Great. Well, it's good to see you. I didn't see you come in. Um, so Dave, last question before I open it up, and then I'm going to give each of you um, a closing comment when we're done about advice to the people in the room and about to Stanford about if you want to get serious about this topic, what should you do? So just to know that I'm going to come back to you for that. But Dave, um, you know, looking forward five years, 10 years, what are we going to be seeing in this country as it relates to the future of organizing and worker power? What, what, what do you see? So I, I think two things. I think we're going, you know, there's just, there is a level of activity that's qualitatively different than anything we've seen recently, although still inadequate. Um, but I think we're going to see more of it. And, and I think what inevitably will happen is that workers and unions and other organizations that care about the economy are going to create non-collective bargaining outlets for workers to organize. You know, we're, we're not relying on traditional collective bargaining. And, and so I think we're going to see a growing, you know, set of organizations that aren't classic unions that are going to, you know, just emerge and just develop because of the conditions. And one quick observation about Peter's point, 130,000 workers, the issue is time off. The economic value or the economic cost of what that group is looking for is measured in the low hundreds of millions of dollars a year. They handle up to 40% of the, the GDP, four to five trillion dollars. The amount of pressure you have to bring to bear to win in this country, something worth a couple of hundred millions of dollars, is immense. This is the conundrum that people have, is how do you succeed in a regime where you, the moon, the sun, and the stars have to line up to win small victories? And so I think what that creates is people are going to look for other sorts of organizational outlets that can deliver victories and deliver them quickly. You know, and, and one of the problems, and Valerie knows this well, that we deal with is adjudicating cases at the NLRB can take two to five years. People voted at Starbucks in my hometown of Buffalo because they want two bucks an hour more now, not in five years. 
And so that's why I think we're going to see more of that activity, because that's the regime that does exist. But I think we're going to see a whole range of other sorts of organizations developing that are going to look outside of traditional labor law. And I'm a believer that the biggest growth that's going to happen is going to come outside of our traditional legal regimes because of those problems and because people need and demand solutions. And creativity will overtake a lot of that. Sounds like a topic for a full another panel at some point. So, and so why don't we open it up for questions? And if I could ask you to uh, stand up and, and uh, state your name and, and your affiliation for the question, that would be great. And then we'll uh, take some closing comments from our panel. So I know Stanford students are really bashful. So if no one raises their hand in a minute, I'm going to cold call somebody. So <laughs> thank you. In the back. Uh, my name's Carrie. I'm a current MFX student um, here at Stanford, and um, I've worked with public sector unions for the last 20 years, and so sometimes shoulder to shoulder, sometimes across the table, either way. Um, something that I've observed, I guess, is that, um, and, and I think very much connected to, to the last point there about sort of the changes that are coming, is that um, the labor movement hasn't always been very introspective. And has often been on the back foot when it comes to things like adoption of technology internally within the movement um, and diversity also at the, in the, at the leadership level. And so I'm curious about you know, what changes does the labor movement need to make to sort of meet this moment, meet this kind of exciting time where new energy is coming into, into the movement. Thank you. And um, were you doing that work in the UK or in the US? Both. OK, it's great. One is that the labor movement, as of about 10 years ago, became a movement majority women and people of color. But if you look at the leadership structures, uh, unfortunately, most of it looks like me and Dave. And that's a, that's a challenge. That's an issue. The other thing is that we have, an, and there was a recent really fine research paper done on this topic, we have a ton of money in the labor movement ton of money invested in, in uh, securities and stocks and all kinds of things, uh, property. One would think that if we're in the kind of desperate situation we're in, and we are, Dave is right, I mean, we are at 6% of the private sector in unions. 1955, we were at 35% in the private sector. What buoys us a lot is the public sector, where we're at about 35%. So our aggregate is 10 to 12. But we are at 6% in the private sector. So this organizing challenge of growth in whatever form it takes, traditional unions or new forms, as Dave suggests, we have the money to do that. The question is the political will to say, we're going to throw down that money and take some risks to try to save ourselves as institutions, viable institutions in this country. I, I would add, and again, Peter's point is exactly right about majority women and people of color. The American labor movement is also majority public employee. It's not just that there's this divergence. An absolute majority of all union members in America are public sector employees, and that is an enormous problem. Um, and so our, our problem about, again, reinventing ourselves and all of that is fundamentally in the private sector economy, which is 80 plus percent of the national economy, where we are irrelevant or on the verge of irrelevant in some places. Um, I, think, I think you'll see and you, you're already seeing across the labor movement, you know, issues around diversity and, you know, whether that's by race or gender, we'll get that right, or we will make large-scale improvements. <laughs> what I'm concerned about is well before we figure out how to grow in the private sector economy. That's the biggest strategic challenge that we have. Um, and frankly, since the heyday of unionism in America in the 1950s, our institution selects for all the wrong things to figure, you know, we're not an institution that rewards growth and innovation 
and experimentation and risk taking. We're an institution that rewards, in too many situations, the opposite of all of that. And it's existential for us. And that's why I'm a believer that we have to, we have to do more experimentation, try more things. But I think inevitably that will lead to other stuff. But, but part of what you're identifying, I think it's, it's, uh, it, it kind of warps it to think of it through. There's a whole set of issues that are unique to public sector unionism that I think you have, to, you have to not generalize about. But the strategic problem we have is in the private sector. Hi, my name's Libby. I'm an MBA one. Um, can you help provide more context on what private sector, like obviously private sector union membership has declined as jobs moved overseas, right? Like what are the unions that, or what are the industries that aren't organized today and like where are those gaps? You know, there's been a lot of talk of the, the, the moment in the 30s, and, and uh, Dave referred to the role that John L. Lewis played in bankrolling and stimulating organizations in basic industry in this country. Rubber, steel, electrical, auto. Those were all industries going into the 30s that were non-union. There was no union there. And there was this dramatic growth in those industries in that period that really created the modern strength of our labor movement. Well, we all know that many of those industries have downsized, moved offshore, although they still remain. Don't let anyone tell you that we're a deindustrialized country. There are 1.3 million auto workers in this country, only 300,000 in the United Auto Workers, but we still have a huge auto industry. So those industries have downsized, they've moved. Many of them have left the Midwest, the traditional strength areas for unions there, moved to the Southeast. Um, so that's been a lot of the story around the private sector erosion of union power is that kind of changing stru structural changes in, in uh, those industries. The other thing is employer resistance. Uh, we, people know of the moment when Ronald Reagan fired the air traffic controllers in 1981, as soon as he was elected, they went on strike, he fired them. That was kind of a signal that it's OK now to take on the unions. When they strike, it's OK to fire them or you know, try to defeat these strikes. Prior to that, there had been sort of an understanding, I think Dave referred to it before, that you know, we're going to have unions, and we're going to have strong unions in this country. We're going to collectively bargain. We're not going to take them on. Well, they started taking us on after that moment and really accelerated attacks on unions. So those two factors, structural change in the economy, increased aggressive stance on the part of employers. In terms of the composition of unions, um, most the, the private sector union members that do still exist in America are in less than 10 states. Um, and so here in California, what you see now, like heavily unionized industries, are healthcare, which is you know, what my organization does, um, the construction trades, um, to some extent hospitality, uh, you know, that's where you see concentrations of unions that still have some semblance of power. But there's, there, is not a, there is not an industry left in America that's majority organized, or even close to it. It's, it just does not exist anymore. So as you think about growing that 6%, is it reinvigorating unions in states with right to work laws? Or is it there are new industries today like at fast food comes to mind, or hotel workers that aren't unionized today that you're interested in unionizing in a state like California? Yeah, I'll, I'll just give you an example. You know, our local union has 100,000 um, members, and there are these things called federally qualified health care centers, which most people refer to as community clinics. They employ 65,000 people in California. 55,000 of them are non-union. That is a campaign that we struggled uh, you know, within my organization, we finally got off the dime, but that's a group of 50,000 non-union workers where there is a clear path to victory in my judgment. That's a big campaign. I think what 
we have to figure out on the growth side is it's easy to make a list. If you think about opportunities with 50,000 plus workers, fast food is much larger than that, retail is much larger, but I'm a believer we need 20 campaigns, 50,000 workers every year, that's, you know, that's a million people. We can compete from that many folks and it's a target rich environment. There is no shortage. And one of the things you just have to figure out is the amount of resources that are brought to bear on this skew. Yeah, we have money. The other side has exponentially more money, and you have to think about that. So I think, I think we have to just you know, get our heads wrapped around what's actionable and what's winnable in less than five years, and don't worry about the law. Think about it in different ways. That's what I believe. Last question, then I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give advice to Stanford and Stanford students as a closing comment. George. I'm, I'm George Parker, an emeritus professor of finance. <clears throat> and I often hear the <clears throat> statement that organized labor is antithetical to growth and productivity and so forth. Not a statement I embrace, but I, but I hear it. And one of the things that comes to my mind when I hear that is that there is a poster child economy where unions are exceedingly strong and I think holding their own, which is Germany. And, and I'm wondering what the secret sauce is for successful unionization in Germany, which is one of the most productive, one of the most manufacturing oriented economies in the world. And unions are thriving, thriving. How can that be? What can the U.S. do to emulate that? Do you want to try that one? Well, I don't know a lot about um, Germany, but I'll bet they have a much stronger, rigorous um, labor law than the one that I am enforcing. And every now and then, uh, every few years, there's a plan to really revamp the NLRA to make it more impactful to uh, have penalties for unfair labor practices, um, to make it easier for employees to join and support unions, um, but they rarely get very far. And so um, maybe we're in a situation now, what with the um, new invigoration that we see across the board where employees and um, political organizations are really going to make that impression on Congress to make sweeping changes. You, you, have, you have a lot of outreach to the European Union movement. I know in, in industry, of course, we're always benchmarking against not only domestic standards, but international standards. Would you say the union, union movement is as international as some of their employers are? I would say no. I had a lot of experience with the Italian labor movement. Spent a lot of time there, worked with Italian unions. They're not the poster child. <laughs> well, they are a poster child for a powerful labor movement. And lunch is better there. Than... <laughs> yeah. Food's better, too. Uh, but this is also true in Germany. These are, these are both countries with a very different labor history. These are post-war industrial regimes uh, in, in the case of Italy, fostered by the resistance to Nazi fascism. In other words, you come out of World War II, the Communist Party and Socialist Parties having played a role in defeating fascism, they're also the leaders of the unions that were formed. So you have a system of political unionism. You have universal coverage of the workforce. In other words, whether you're a member of a union or not, you have the rights to the benefits and wages of a national agreement. And the same is basically true in Germany. So density in Italy is 25%, but 85% of the workers are covered by national agreements. And, the, and, and Germany is similar. And both of them come out of a post-war paradigm of liberation. Uh, different in Germany, obviously, because it was uh, you had the allies and their presence there, but uh, it's a very different industrial relations system. I would love to see it in this country. I'd love if we every you know Dave sector is covered by a national agreement. It'd be fabulous. Well, I think 
do this, but we're already at the time where we need to do quick closing comments. And so again, thank you for coming and thank you for starting a conversation that should be a whole day. In fact, it should be a whole course, not a one hour conversation. But um, let me ask you for any advice you have for students, faculty members, Stanford, business school. Well, I would like to acknowledge as Chairman Gould, also one of the greatest um, chairman of the National Labor Relations Board. Um, and I, what, I was very um, pleased to see him appointed. And um, he made a lot of difference in um, the direction of the board at that time. So um, I, I just want to acknowledge you, but I can't really see you. Because <laughs> there you are. <laughs> um, I guess I, I end where I started, that um, all of you are going to um, have to make a decision about what you're going to do with your education. And I just want you to keep in mind that this nation has committed itself to democracy in the workplace. And even though there are lots of problems, there are lots of things that need to be improved, it is the law of the land. People have rights, and we do the best that we can, given uh, the priorities of whatever Congress we're dealing with, to be there for employees. They are not alone when it comes to um, seeking to improve their working conditions wherever they work. And I, I know that uh, we will continue to protect them. Well, I, I read the New York Times business section yesterday. It said, capitalism is up for scrutiny at elite business schools. <laughs> and I said, I'm going. I'm going tomorrow to Stanford. But then I found out it's a bunch of these quaint little Eastern institutions. And the U word is never mentioned in this article. So kudos to Stanford for being on the vanguard here. Uh, I, would, I would again pitch the labor movement as a force for fighting income inequality and fighting for democracy. Fighting for democracy. Very important point, which we haven't gone into. but. The rate of support for Democratic candidates and for opposing MAGA and all the lunacy is much higher when people are unionized. And the lack of unions and strong unions and that 6% density explains a lot of why we have the lunacy that's happening in this country. So we need to fortify the labor movement. We need new creative minds and approaches. Dave's talked about the need for thinking outside the box. Business school education prepares people to do that. So find that ideology with the working class and bring your talents to our movement. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, just a couple of quick points. You know, the, the United States and the business community in the United States has been uniquely hostile towards unions, and they've been extraordinarily successful. Um, so, like, they're kicking our butts. I'll stipulate to that. Um, but trust your senses, right? We got 200,000 homeless people in California. Two miles from this campus, there's people sleeping in cars. Inequality is an enormous problem. It is rotting this society from the inside out. Majorities of citizens in this country do not want the world we are tolerating and we need you guys. It doesn't have to be like this. You don't, you know, we can create a different ethic and a different, you know, understanding among us. Um, and I think that's at the root. We have to have a different social contract. We need the business community. We need enlightened leadership. Um, and Germany has a social democratic tradition that's very different from this country, but we can create that with folks like yourself. And I just want to appreciate all of you taking an hour in the middle of the World Cup to come out and listen to us instead of watching the game. So thank you for doing that. Great. Well, uh, in closing, I'll just say a couple of things. First of all, I also want to acknowledge Professor Gould's presence. And thank you for being the person that I took labor law from when I was at Stanford Business School many years ago. 
learned a lot then, and I appreciate your leadership for a long time period. Um, I also want to thank our panelists, Valerie, Peter, and Dave, for a very stimulating conversation. I think we've opened up a, a conversation that has a lot to ways to go. We barely scratched the surface on a number of topics, and I think this is really important to continue this dialogue. Um, I want to thank Anat and the, her center for hosting us and asking all of you to come and join and thank all of you for participating. And my only uh, addition to the panelists about what I would encourage you to do is um, when you have an environment, as Dave described, where it's not working the way the majority of people want, if you were in a business environment, you'd say that's a huge opportunity for innovation and new models and new energy and leadership and entrepreneurship. I think that's absolutely the case. It would be great if Stanford Business School was the home where that innovation happened. It's, it's, uh, it's ripe for it, and I know the panelists here would welcome conversations with anyone privately who would be interested in pursuing that. So with that, thank you for joining, and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you again. For